So I, I should start by saying that uh, we are a small group that have been working on what I'm going to talk uh, about to today, which is Nia Shaviv and me. And then actually my son and uh, my co-worker, Martin uh, Inghoff. Um, so what I'm going to talk about uh, today is, uh, I mean, I'm going to talk about the connection between the cosmic ray clouds and climate. Uh, and I'm going to give you a, a simple introduction to, uh, to what the idea is. And um, today it's going to be slightly more uh, a technical talk. Uh, I will do it as uh, gently as possible. But uh, we've actually had a serious problem for the theory uh, over uh, quite a number of, of years. Uh, since 2009, uh, we realized uh, from uh, other people's work that there was a serious problem. And I will talk about how we actually solved this, uh, this uh, problem. And uh, I will uh, go through uh, what it actually uh, means. But let's uh, start with the uh, idea that you have a supernova that goes off. Uh, and uh, I mean, one of the main characters in what I'm going to talk about is cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are, are mainly produced when you have supernova. Uh, which are these big stars uh, which are exploding and they produce a shock front that uh, accelerate the particles to extremely high energy and it means that the interstellar space is actually radioactive and particles are, are moving through uh, uh, the interstellar space and some of them they enter into our uh, solar system. And uh, as we already heard, the solar activity can actually modulate uh, how many cosmic rays that are entering into the inner part of the solar system. If we look at this figure, we have measurements uh, from about 1950 until uh, uh, recently. And you see in the top figure, the blue figure, which is uh, changes in cosmic rays, which are measured by what we call neutron monitors. And you can see this beautiful 11-year uh, cycle uh, where it, uh, the intensity goes up and down. And below in the orange, you see uh, the uh, sunspot number. And you can see you have this uh, inverse correlation. So when you have a high solar activity, the sun's magnetic field works as a better shield against cosmic rays, so fewer cosmic rays enters into the uh, Earth system. So the cosmic rays, as they enter the solar system, some of them will end up in the top of the atmosphere. And what they do, they produce what we call a cascade down through uh, the atmosphere. Uh, what you see here is, uh, I think, uh, uh, it, it's a very high energy uh, proton going into the atmosphere and it's producing a lot of secondary uh, particles. It is ionizing, as we already heard, uh, the atmosphere. So most of the ions that we have uh, in the atmosphere, in particular all the oceans, is almost exclusively from uh, cosmic rays. In addition, we produce what we call uh, cosmogenic isotopes, things like carbon-14. You know carbon-14 from uh, you know, archaeological, when you want to date uh, certain uh, biological materials. Uh, but carbon-14 is also entering into uh, the leaves of organic uh, material in a tree, for instance, and by, by looking at how much carbon-14 there is, which is produced by cosmic rays, you can say something about how active the sun was at that year. And if you have tree rings uh, and you have old trees, you can go back uh, at least uh, and even more than 10,000 years. And that's one of the ways that we know how solar activity changed over uh, nearly uh, 10,000 years. They are produced, I mean, other isotopes are produced by cosmic rays like beryllium-10. Uh, and beryllium-10 has a tendency to attach to aerosols in the atmosphere and the aerosols then become snowflakes and the snowflakes falls on, for instance, uh, the ice uh, sheets in Greenland. And then by looking at how much beryllium-10 you have in the ice sheets, you can say also something about uh, how active the sun was back in time. And beryllium-10 
can, you can go even further back uh, in time than when you, what you can do with the carbon-14. So the interesting thing about cosmic rays in the atmosphere is that each time there is a large change in the, um, in the uh, cosmic rays, there seems to be a change in climate. You have seen so many examples over the last two days, and I'll show you just one here, where the top figure, that is the change in temperature over the last thousand years. You can see um, that you have a um, medieval warm period uh, for, for uh, about a thousand years. That's when the Vikings went to Greenland and uh, they stayed there, but around uh, 1300 and uh, the, the, the first settlements, uh, they started to get into problems around here. The year 1500, uh, the last settlements were, were gone. And that is because we entered into the Little Ice Age, so it was much harder to, uh, to live in uh, Greenland at that time. So we had the Little Ice Age and we now uh, came out of the Little Ice Age, which is quite fortunate because we are living in a much better time than what people were enduring during the Little Ice Age. If you look at the bottom figure, you see this correlation. This is uh, from carbon-14 and beryllium-10. It is increasing downwards, so you have the opposite. So where it looks like it's, it's low, it's actually because the cosmic rays are quite high. So when you have high cosmic rays, you have a cold climate. So that's the, uh, the uh, connection between uh, this type of um, uh, cosmic rays and changes in climate. So the question that uh, we asked actually now more than 20 years ago was what could be the connection? I mean, why should there be a connection between solar activity and climate? And since uh, the idea that uh, solar irradiance probably not could explain what we, what we were seeing, uh, the idea was to look uh, elsewhere, and the idea was to look at things like the Earth's cloud cover. What you see here is some satellite observations of uh, the Earth, and you can see that you have uh, clouds. Uh, I mean, this is uh, what you see here if you look at uh, the Earth. Uh, so, I mean, over the oceans, you have a cloudiness almost of 70%, so that means 70% of the time you have clouds. So clouds are extremely important for uh, the Earth's energy budget. Uh, the net effect uh, is on the order of 20 to 30 watts per square meter. And that means that if you have a systematic change somehow in the Earth's cloudiness, that would actually be a, a very effective way of changing the energy that goes into the climate system. Um, so that was the general idea, and what we did at that time was to take satellite data and try to compare changes in Earth's cloudiness uh, from satellites with changes in the uh, cosmic rays. And this is the figure that uh, we more or less started with. Actually, I should say that when we started, uh, when I started, we only had data until 1990 because the uh, data was not released at that time. So we had only a correlation over a very short period. But what you see is data from 1983 until 2006. And the red curve is actually the changes in cosmic rays measured by uh, neutron monitors. So these are instrumental uh, records of uh, the cosmic ray flux of secondary particles that enters into the atmosphere. And the blue curve is low clouds from what uh, the data set called the ISKIP data set. And you see this very nice correlation between the two. And that was, of course, a, 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 you know, it, that was an inspiration um, that there could be such a connection between cosmic rays and clouds. But it's not any guarantee that there is a real link. Uh, it could, could be just uh, collision, collisions by, uh, by accident, of course. At that time, uh, it was very uncertain, and there was no mechanism uh, to explain what was going on. It could also be that it is other part of solar activity that is modulating uh, things, which has nothing to do with cosmic rays. So um, it was sort of an inspiration to, uh, to, to do further work. Now, the changes that you see here are of the order uh, one to, uh, well, it's on the order of 2% changes in the, uh, in the uh, cloudiness. 
uh, of low clouds. And that is actually on the order of one watt per square meter uh, over the solar cycle. And uh, if I show the figure that Nir also showed, which is that the ocean heat content or the sea level surface uh, temperature or um, what is the sea level change, uh, all of these data, uh, independent data, are all showing that the energy that goes in and out of the oceans over 11 years is on the order of one watt per square meter. And it fits very nicely with what the clouds uh, are doing. And again, it's almost an order of magnitude larger than what you get from solar irradiance. And over this period here, it, the solar irradiance is measured by satellites. So the 11 year uh, variations in solar irradiance is actually too small to explain uh, what we're seeing. So there is an amplification mechanism uh, going on. So the problem is, uh, I mean, we have an empirical evidence that there is a relation between uh, cosmic rays and, uh, and clouds, but of course, if that is the link, the question is what would be the mechanism? And that's actually what uh, we have been working on for more than uh, 20 years. And the general idea is that we start from the uh, left-hand side, where we have the ionization in the atmosphere from cosmic rays. And then the idea is that this ionization with the ions, uh, they help stabilize gases in the atmosphere, so you get uh, small stable aerosols, uh, and this is what we call nucleation. So we get nucleation of, uh, of particles, and then subsequently they have to grow because they are one to two nanometers uh, large, and then they have to grow maybe to a, to a hundred nanometer before they actually affect the clouds. And that means that they have to increase by almost a, a factor of a million in, um, in their mass. So. The idea is that by changing the ionization, we change the number of what we call CCN, or uh, this is also called the cloud condensation nuclei. And if we change the cloud condensation nuclei, the idea is then we change the properties of clouds. And I can show you that this is actually the case because if we, if we, a look at this picture here, where you see a part as this satellite uh, picture of uh, the oceans, and you have a, a large, large region with uh, low clouds, and you see all these stripes, and this is called uh, ship tracks. So these are ships sailing along, and because they have this dirty fuel, they pump out extra aerosols. So you can see in the wake of uh, the ships. Uh, these aerosols insert into the, uh, the clouds and they actually change the microphysical properties of clouds and you can see they're much wider. And if you could do this by cosmic rays um, over the whole Earth, it will be a very effective way of changing the uh, radiative uh, balance uh, of the Earth. So you see this very nice um, uh, idea that if you change the the uh, the uh, number of aerosols, you can change cloud uh, properties. Here you have a, uh, a a slightly larger version, and you can see that it is actually the individual clouds that are changed, and it's not just uh, some kind of uh, pollution directly uh, that you are seeing. So we had this idea that there should be a connection between. Uh, cosmic rays and the formation of, uh, of aerosols. So we had the, uh, what we can call an experimental challenge because uh, now we could formulate a theory uh, that uh, if we change the ionization, we should be able to see uh, nucleation of small aerosols. And if this was the first part of our work that was done in between 2004 and 2007. And uh, we had this uh, experimental chamber uh, and the idea is that we put in uh, some gases which are uh, important, which is uh, sulfur dioxide, it's uh, ozone, and it's uh, water vapor. That is actually a fundamental ingredient also in the atmosphere. And the, 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 the atmosphere we have in the chamber is very similar to what you have over the uh, Pacific Ocean, for instance. And when you have these, uh, these gases inside the chamber, then we have some lamps that can 
uh, irradiate the, the chamber, which mimics the, 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 the sun, and we get photochemistry and we produce sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid is one of the most important molecules for building and growing uh, aerosols, particles into cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, and it's produced completely naturally uh, in the atmosphere, although uh, sulfuric acid sounds really bad. It is in, in extremely small uh, concentrations. Uh, so we had this concentration in the chamber. We kept everything constant except the ionization. And we got this uh, result you can see here. So along the uh, uh, lower uh, axis, the horizontal axis, we have the increase in the ionization that corresponds to the cosmic rays. And on the other axis, we have uh, the number of small particles produced, that is small aerosols uh, on the size of uh, about three nanometers. And you see that as we increase the ionization, we increase the number of small aerosols. So there is a nucleation mechanism, which was uh, really great. So we were very happy when we got this uh, result because we thought that we were, we were home free, that uh, we have now proven that uh, there is a mechanism and it works. Uh, it produces new aerosols and uh, these aerosols will grow to cloud condensation nuclei. But the thing is that they actually have to grow quite a lot, uh, as I already mentioned. Uh, here you see the relative size uh, between uh, the small nucleated aerosol. It has to grow to a size uh, that you can see here. And if this small aerosol does not grow to cloud condensation nuclei, there would be no effect uh, on clouds from uh, the, uh, the uh, cosmic rays. And the thing is that, that many things could go wrong before you end up uh, to become such a large uh, particle. We were very optimistic. However, uh, people, they started doing uh, numerical uh, experiments. What you see here is uh, on the lower axis, you, you see uh, around the number one, uh, that's where you have a nucleation of particles. So they run a model where they put in about 5% more small aerosols in the, this model. Now, if this idea should work, we would expect that the particles that are produced within the circle, that should grow more or less horizontally. So the number of particles that we get, so if you have put in 5% more particles, you will also get 5% more cloud condensation nuclei. But all the numerical models or the global circulation models where they had uh, very sophisticated aerosol models, they all ha had the result that the particles grew but very, very few survived <coughs> to cloud condensation nuclei. So that meant that that would be a serious problem. I mean, if this is correct, uh, the theory is wrong. So all this modeling, and I mean, just 2016, uh, there were model results saying the same thing, that uh, there's no uh, effect. So. From 2009 and onwards, it was quite clear that in the media and uh, many, many scientists were saying that what we were doing was not, I mean, it was a good idea, but it's all wrong because it doesn't work. And it was sort of written everywhere that what we were doing uh, was, wasn't working. Um, so you can see here <laughs> that we're quite a lot uh, going on. So <laughs> that was the end of uh, the theory. However, as also uh, Nia uh, showed, what you see here is uh, supposed to be our um, uh, solar system. And what you see is this plasma coming out from the sun. And you can see these explosions. Th th this last explosion you see is actually one of the largest that we have had. It was in 2012. It did not hit the Earth, but if it had hit the Earth, it would have had serious problems for all the satellites. So many of them would have been, uh, uh, you know, fried and uh, would not have been working. But these explosions with, the, with this uh, uh, plasma going out, that is almost like an umbrella. Uh, for the cosmic rays, and that is what gives you this uh, picture that you see, uh, or, or have already seen, where the, the, the 
red uh, dotted curve is the cosmic rays. And what we actually see uh, is that uh, we have a dip in the cosmic rays when this plasma is moving out uh, through the planets. Um, and it's 15 days before and 20 days after. So it, we are talking about an effect uh, over uh, a week. And you see this dip in the cosmic rays. But if we look at this Aronet data, which is actually aerosols, we see that there is a dip. So when there is, w w when there is a decrease in the cosmic rays, we actually get a significant dip in the uh, number of uh, aerosols. And then we have three independent data sets uh, from different satellites, which all are showing the same thing. You also notice that there seems to be a delay uh, effect here, and that's simply because the aerosols, which are uh, nucleated, they have to grow. So all these are independent uh, data sets. So we have a link uh, that illustrates that... Uh, no, I was talking about the delay, yeah, that's true. The delay, which is on the order of, uh, of uh, five days, it fits very nicely with the time it takes for the aerosols to grow from one nanometer to about uh, 50 uh, nanometer. So we have some observation that indicates that the process is actually going on. We somehow had to prove uh, that uh, that there is a mechanism, but we did not really understand it. So we had to go back to our experiments and try to figure out what was going on. Uh, so the real problem is uh, now not this part where we have the nucleation of the small particles. I mean, even the cloud experiment at CERN has uh, reproduced uh, the, the, this, this feature where we produce the small particles. It is this part here where we need to grow uh, to uh, the cloud condensation nuclei. And uh, myself and uh, the small group and Nia and so on, we worked uh, for uh, the last almost five years on this uh, problem. And the first two years we spent on a wrong theory. So it turns out that uh, what we were doing, uh, it was the wrong theory. So. And, and the, the, the reason was that the, the experiments ruled it out. We had a beautiful theory in the sense that uh, it was uh, the idea was that it was uh, chemistry that was going on and the chemistry reactions and everything seems to be working fine. But in the experiments, we couldn't find that, uh, the, that thing. Um, so, so the theory was uh, actually wrong. So we had to start all over again and it turned out uh, that we finally got the idea and now now things get a little bit more involved but i will try to do it if i want to explain you what's going on so why why can the particles grow to cloud condensation nuclei anyhow so imagine that you have an aerosol here that need to grow and you have the ions uh, here. So what is happening is that there is an interaction between the ions. So they actually stick to the aerosols. And when they stick to the aerosol, they actually add a little mass to the aerosol, a very small uh, part of the mass. Uh, and it turns out that this type of interactions, there are four types that can be going on. It has to do with either re recombination, that you have here, or you're charging aerosols. In all of these, you add a small mass to the aerosol. So um, this effect is uh, so far uh, completely ignored in all modeling. And uh, so, so it's not very strange that uh, you will not see the effect in, in these global models, because these effects are not included in the models. So let me give you a few numbers. Now, when you have an aerosol, I told you that a lot of the growth is caused by sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid stick to the molecules uh, or to the aerosols, and the aerosol grow by that way. Typically, in the atmosphere, you have about one million of these aerosols, uh, sorry, of, of the sulfuric acid molecules. Uh, but the number of ions is only on the order of a thousand ions per cubic centimeter. So naively, if you 
just take these numbers, you will find that uh, the growth from ions would only be about 0.1%, so it's completely negligible. Um, and that's why people have uh, probably uh, ignored uh, these effects. But it turns out that because these ions are charged, they actually, uh, you have to take into account that there are Coulomb forces, there are mirror forces, and there are van der Waal forces that all help uh, this interaction. So you can say you have inter uh, enhanced uh, interactions. And these enhanced interaction actually means that the growth rate, instead of being 0.1%, it is actually increased by almost two orders of magnitude, almost a factor of 100. And that means that uh, in the atmosphere, 10% uh, of the growth of these particles is actually caused by the ions. That, that is quite a lot. Uh, in our experiments, uh, because we cannot have such a low concentration of sulfuric uh, acid because then things will grow so slowly that we will lose all our particles. So we have to have a fairly high uh, uh, or relatively high concentration of sulfuric acid and the growth rate is only on the order of 1%. Uh, so here we have the theoretical uh, foundation, but what we have to do is try to see if we can uh, show it experimentally. And that's a real challenge because the change in growth rate is only on the order of 1% in our experiments. And that is very, very difficult to, uh, to measure. So let me show you uh, the sort of inspiration for the type of experiments that we are doing. This is actually aerosol formation in the forest uh, in Finland. Uh, the concentrations of gases, because it is in a forest, is completely different from what you have over the oceans. But what you have here is the day uh, as time goes along. And here you have the size. So this is one nanometer, this is 10 nanometer, and this is 100 nanometer. So here there are cloud condensation nuclei. But you see, as the sun goes up, you get the photochemistry, you get uh, sufficient with sulfuric acid, so you can actually start the nucleation. So you have particles growing here. This kind of plot is called a banana plot. <coughs> and we wanted to do exactly the same thing. So uh, have a cycle, uh, almost like a daily cycle. But instead of having the sun going up and down, we had the cosmic rays going up and down. And instead of having 24 hours, we have a cycle of four hours. So how does that look? It looks something like this. You can see that uh, down here you have the time, you have about uh, 400 hours. It's about 16 days. And what we do is that every second hour we turn the ionization on and off. And uh, when we turn it on, we produce slightly more particles. And then we turn it off and we produce slightly less particles. And by repeating the experiment so many times, we can make an average so we can uh, get the noise down, so we can actually measure these very, very low uh, growth rates. So here you have the, 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 the data I showed you just before with all, all this data for just one parameter. And here you see when you add the cycles on top of each other, uh, then you get a, this average cycle. So you have the first two hours when we have the ionization go, uh, going on. You have here the size of the particles, and you can see they are growing. Uh, and then we can compare how fast they grow compared to when you are not in the ionization. So, uh, and it, I mean, so, so, and, and with this, this feature, by, by repeating and keeping everything stable, and I, I should say it took more than a year to get all our, our, our data um, because everything has to be extremely stable. Uh, if something, I mean, if just a little thing happened, I mean, keeping the experiment stable for such long periods is actually quite difficult. Anyhow, it turns out that when we compare our data, well, here we have the, uh, the uh, increase in growth rates. Uh, here we have the sulfuric acid uh, concentration. The, the only important thing here is that the data seems to be fitting very nicely with the theory uh, that I uh, discussed. I'm not going into any uh, details about how it's done. 
Uh, and also, if we change the ionization, we, we see uh, that it, it uh, fits very nicely. So I can say that the, the theory and the experiments are uh, quite consistent. Also, if we look at details in the experiment for various, uh, for various uh, parameters that we are changing, that, I mean, what we are changing is the amount of sulfuric acid we have in the chamber. We see that uh, although there's a large scatter in the uh, data, I mean, and that, that actually reflects the difficulty in doing these experiments, but you can see over here that the data seems to be folding right uh, according to the lines, which is uh, the theory. So it indicates that uh, the theory and the experiments are, are fitting quite well. So how or why should this be important uh, in the real uh, atmosphere? Um, if you look at this uh, map here, it's a simulation of and it's based on the uh, sulfuric acid concentration that you have, and they try to measure uh, the growth rate of aerosols. And you see over the oceans, uh, which is most of the surface of the Earth, the growth rates are on the order of 0.2, 200 of a nanometer per hour, so it's extremely small. And it means that the sulfuric acid concentration is on the order uh, about a million molecules per cubic centimeter. It, this is quite low, and that means that relatively the effect of the ions is quite important. So the sulfuric acid, if the sulfuric acid was high, then the effect of the ions uh, on the growth rate would be too small to be important, but in the real atmosphere, the sulfuric acid uh, concentration is always quite uh, low. So if we now look at this theoretical curve, um, what you have here is the diameter of the particles that are growing, and up here you have the ion production that you ha have in the atmosphere. Um, and what you see, these lines here, is uh, how much the, the uh, ionization is adding to the, uh, to the growth. So here it's 5%. Uh, if we go up here, it's 10% and it increases. And it all depends on, of course, the size of the particles and, of course, how much ionization that you have in the atmosphere. So in the lower part of the atmosphere, you might have uh, only a few ions per cubic centimeter per second and you will get, um, you know, between 5 and 10% uh, of the growth is actually caused by ions. Uh, if we go higher in the atmosphere, in high in the troposphere, we might get up to 30 uh, ions per cubic centimeter, and you see that you get close to about 20% uh, of the growth is caused uh, by ions. And if you have changes in the ionization, yeah, then you have change in the growth rate of the particles. And that's extremely important for the survival of the particles. So by having these changes, it actually it means the, the, the whole thing, whether the particles will survive to cloud condensation uh, nuclei. So the consequences of this is um, that, that uh, we, we, this is experimental growth of aerosol to large sizes, um, that the theory actually seems to be, I mean, it might be consistent with the, these Forbes decreases that I showed you. Uh, the effect should also be consistent with the solar cycle uh, changes where we have on the order of 1.5 watt per square meter. Uh, we also seen that uh, the large changes that we have over, um, over the Holocene, those the last 10,000 years, uh, th there are these beautiful uh, correlations. And finally, what Nia also was showing was on these million year uh, timescales up to 100 million years, uh, several hundred million years, um, this, will my, this, this, this effect can be quite uh, Im, Im, important. I mean, if, if you have a supernova that goes off, you might increase the ionization for a few thousand years where you go up quite high in this, uh, depending on the, it depends on the, uh, the, the, the distance to the supernova, but you can really change uh, the uh, properties of aerosols uh, by 
by, by this uh, effect. So it should be quite important. And also, if you go between spi spiral arms and interspiral arms, you will have life changes in the ionization and therefore in the survival uh, probability of, uh, of these aerosols. So it should be quite uh, important. So, um, let me just summarize uh, the, the mechanism. The idea is uh, that we have some gases in the atmosphere uh, that are produced perfectly naturally, uh, probably from, uh, I mean, photochemistry, but some of the uh, species are actually from uh, bio uh, processes. And then you have the ionization from uh, the Milky Way, uh, where the sun can modulate how, ma how much gets into the, uh, the atmosphere. So you get the nucleation. But the ions are not just helping the nucleation, they're also helping the growth. And uh, by changing the number of cloud condensation nuclei, you are changing the, uh, the uh, properties of clouds. And then in the end, the energy budget of the, the, the Earth. So let me conclude uh, this talk. Um, I mean, we have cosmic rays that comes in and uh, they are producing ions in the atmosphere. This is not controversial at all. Uh, this is a, a, an experimental fact, uh, observational fact. Um, and also the ions, they help this nucleation formation of uh, small clusters of small aerosols. Um, and uh, these small aerosols have to grow. And it, then the second thing, which is the, the, the problem that we solved uh, recently, is that the ions also helped the growth of these small uh, particles to become cloud condensation nuclei. And that means that we sort of have the whole chain now uh, secured, uh, both uh, observationally, uh, theoretically, and experimentally. So I think that, that part looks very good. We would like to do some more work also on the uh, how, how it changes the radiative uh, properties of clouds, and that will, will come uh, soon. So the implications is that uh, when you have more cosmic rays, you actually change the properties uh, mainly of low clouds, and also because low clouds are the most important clouds uh, for the uh, Earth's uh, energy budget. Um, so when we have fewer cosmic rays, we actually get a warmer uh, world. And uh, maybe, I mean, that's what we've been talking about for the last two days, that part of the tw 20th century warming uh, might actually be uh, because of uh, changes in solar activity. And this mechanism that I'm talking about today might actually be important or quite important in, uh, in that, uh, that feature. Um, also, the cooling that has happened over the last 10,000 years uh, seems to be uh, fit uh, or fit very nicely into this. And of course, the very long time scales that I just uh, mentioned and Nia has been uh, doing a lot of work on. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you.